Georg Lukacs, also Georg Lukacs, born Georg Bernhard Lowinger, the 13th of April 1885 to the 4th of June 1971, was a Hungarian Marxist philosopher, esthetician, literary historian, and critic. He was one of the founders of Western Marxism, an interpretive tradition that departed from the Marxist ideological orthodoxy of the Soviet Union. He developed the theory of reification and contributed to Marxist theory with developments of Karl Marx's theory of class consciousness. He was also a philosopher of Leninism. He ideologically developed and organized Lenin's pragmatic revolutionary practices into the formal philosophy of vanguard party revolution. As a literary critic Lukacs was especially influential, because of his theoretical developments of realism and of the novel as a literary genre. In 1919, he was appointed the Hungarian Minister of Culture of the Government of the Short-Lived Hungarian Soviet Republic March -August 1919. Lukacs has been described as the preeminent Marxist intellectual of the Stalinist era, though assessing his legacy can be difficult as Lukacs seemed both to support Stalinism as the embodiment of Marxist thought, and yet also to champion a return to pre-Stalinist Marxism. <laughs> Life and politics Georg Lukacs was born Lowinger Georg Bernet, in Budapest, Austria-Hungary, to the investment banker Joseph Lowinger later Shigeti Lukacs Joseph, 1855–1928 and his wife Adele Wertheimer Wertheimer Adele, 1860–1917, who were a wealthy Jewish family. He had a brother and sister. Joseph Lowinger was knighted by the Empire and received a baronial title, making Georg Lukacs a baron as well, through inheritance. As an Austro-Hungarian subject, the full names of Georg Lukacs were the German Baron Georg Bernhard Lukacs von Schagedin, and the Hungarian Schagedi Lukacs Georg Bernet. As a writer, he published under the names Georg Lukacs and Georg Lukacs. Georg Lukacs participated in intellectual circles in Budapest, Berlin, Florence and Heidelberg. He received his doctorate of jurisprudence in 1906 from the Royal Hungarian University of Kolesvar. In 1909, he completed his doctorate of philosophy at the University of Budapest under the direction of Zsolt Biothi. Topic: <laughs> Pre-Marxist period. Whilst at university in Budapest, Lukacs was part of socialist intellectual circles through which he met Irvin Zabo, an anarcho-syndicalist who introduced him to the works of Georges Sorel (1847–1922), the French proponent of revolutionary syndicalism. In that period, Lukacs's intellectual perspectives were modernist and anti-positivist. From 1904 to 1908, he was part of a theater troupe that produced modernist, psychologically realistic plays by Henrik Ibsen, August Strindberg, and Gerhard Hauptmann. Lukacs spent much time in Germany, and studied at the University of Berlin from 1906 to 1907, during which time he made the acquaintance of the philosopher Georg Simmel. Later, in 1913, whilst in Heidelberg he befriended Max Weber, Emil Lask, Ernst Bloch, and Stefan George. The idealist system to which Lukacs subscribed at this time was intellectually indebted to Neo-Kantianism, then the dominant philosophy in German universities, and to Plato, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, Soren Kierkegaard, Wilhelm Dilthe, and Fyodor Dostoevsky. In that period, he published Soul and Form, Die Seel und Die Formen, Berlin, 1911, TR. 1974, and The Theory of the Novel, 1916-1920, TR. 1971, after the beginning of the First World War, Lukacs was exempted from military service. In 1914, he married the Russian political activist Yelena Grabenko. In 1915, Lukacs returned to Budapest, where he was the leader of the Sunday Circle, an intellectual salon. Its concerns were the cultural themes that arose from the existential works of Dostoevsky, which thematically aligned with Lukacs's interests in his last years at Heidelberg. As a salon, the Sunday Circle sponsored cultural events whose participants included literary and musical avant-garde figures, such as Karl Mannheim, the composer Bella Bartok, Bella Balaj, Arnold Hauser, Zoltan Kodaly and Karl Polanyi, some of them also attended the weekly salons. In 1918, the last year of the First World War 1914 the Sunday Circle became divided. They dissolved the Salon because of their divergent politics. Several of the leading members accompanied Lukacs into the Communist Party of Hungary. Communist leader 
In light of the First World War and the Russian Revolution of 1917, Lukacs rethought his ideas. He became a committed Marxist in this period and joined the fledgling Communist Party of Hungary in 1918. As part of the government of the short-lived Hungarian Soviet Republic, Lukacs was made People's Commissar for Education and Culture he was deputy to the Commissar for Education Z. Sigmund Kunfi. During the Hungarian Soviet Republic, Lukacs was a theoretician of the Hungarian version of the Red Terror. In an article in the Napesava, 15 April 1919, he wrote that, "...the possession of the power of the state is also a moment for the destruction of the oppressing classes." A moment, we have to use. Lukacs later became a commissar of the 5th Division of the Hungarian Red Army, in which capacity he ordered the execution of eight of his own soldiers in Poroslo, in May 1919, which he later admitted in an interview. After the Hungarian Soviet Republic was defeated, Lukacs was ordered by Kuhn to remain behind with Otto Korvin, when the rest of the leadership evacuated. Lukacs and Korvin's mission was to clandestinely reorganize the communist movement, but this proved to be impossible. Lukacs went into hiding, with the help of photographer Olga Mate. After Corvin's capture in 1919, Lukacs fled from Hungary to Vienna. He was arrested but was saved from extradition due to a group of writers including Thomas and Heinrich Mann. Thomas Mann later based the character Naftha on Lukacs in his novel The Magic Mountain. He married his second wife, Gertrude Bortstieber in 1919 in Vienna. During his time in Vienna in the 1920s, Lukacs befriended other left communists who were working or in exile there, including Victor Serge, Adolf Joff and Antonio Gramsci. Around that time, Lukacs began to develop Leninist ideas in the field of philosophy. His major works in this period were the essays collected in his magnum opus History and Class Consciousness Geschichte und Klassenbewitzsein, Berlin, 1923. Although these essays display signs of what Vladimir Lenin referred to as ultra-leftism, they provided Leninism with a substantive philosophical basis. In July 1924, Grigory Zinoviev attacked this book along with the work of Karl Korsch at the Fifth Comintern Congress. In 1924, shortly after Lenin's death, Lukacs published in Vienna the short study Lenin, a study in the unity of his thought Lenin, Studi über den Zusammenhang seiner Gedanken. In 1925, he published a critical review of Nikolai Bukharin's Manual of Historical Materialism. As a Hungarian exile, he remained active on the left wing of Hungarian Communist Party, and was opposed to the Moscow backed program of Bela Kuhn. His Bloom Theses of 1928 called for the overthrow of the counter revolutionary regime of Admiral Horthy in Hungary by a strategy similar to the popular fronts that arose in the 1930s. He advocated a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry as a transitional stage leading to the dictatorship of the proletariat. After Lukacs's strategy was condemned by the Comintern, he retreated from active politics into theoretical work. Lukacs left Vienna in 1929 first for Berlin, then for Budapest. Topic. Under Stalin and Rikosi In 1930, while residing in Budapest, Lukacs was summoned to Moscow. This coincided with the signing of a Viennese police order for his expulsion. Leaving their children to attend their studies, Lukacs and his wife ventured to Moscow in March 1930. Soon after his arrival, Lukacs was prevented from leaving and assigned to work alongside David Ryazanov in the basement. At the Marx Engels Institute, Lukacs returned to Berlin in 1931 and in 1933 he once again left Berlin for Moscow to attend the Institute of Philosophy of the Russian Academy of Sciences. During this time, Lukacs first came into contact with the works of young Marx. Lukacs and his wife were not permitted to leave the Soviet Union until after the Second World War. During Stalin's Great Purge, Lukacs was sent to internal exile in Tashkent for a time, where he and Johannes Becker became friends. Lukacs survived the purges of the Great Terror, which claimed the lives of an estimated 80% of the Hungarian emigres in the Soviet Union. There is much debate among historians concerning the extent to which Lukacs accepted Stalinism. In 1945, Lukacs and his wife returned to Hungary. As a member of the Hungarian Communist Party, he took part in establishing the new Hungarian government. From 1945, Lukacs was a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Between 1945 and 1946 he strongly criticized non-communist philosophers and writers. Lukacs has been accused of playing an administrative 
Legal bureaucratic role in the removal of independent and non-communist intellectuals such as Bela Hamvas, Istvan Bibo, Lajos Prohaska, and Karoli Kuranyi from Hungarian academic life. Between 1946 and 1953, many non-communist intellectuals, including Bibo, were imprisoned or forced into menial work or manual labor. Lukacs's personal aesthetic and political position on culture was always that socialist culture would eventually triumph in terms of quality. He thought it should play out in terms of competing cultures, not by administrative measures. In 1948-49 Lukacs's position for cultural tolerance was smashed in a Lukacs purge when Matyas Rikosi turned his famous salami tactics on the Hungarian Communist Party. In the mid-1950s Lukacs was reintegrated into party life. The party used him to help purge the Hungarian Writers' Union in 1955-56. Thomas Achill and Tiber Mere, former secretaries of the Hungarian Writers Union, both believe that Lukacs participated grudgingly and cite Lukacs leaving the presidium and the meeting at the first break as evidence of this reluctance. Topic: <laughs> Destalinization. In 1956, Lukacs became a minister of the brief communist revolutionary government led by Imre Nagy, which opposed the Soviet Union. At this time Lukacs's daughter led a short-lived party of communist revolutionary youth. Lukacs's position on the 1956 revolution was that the Hungarian Communist Party would need to retreat into a coalition government of socialists, and slowly rebuild its credibility with the Hungarian people. While a minister in Nagy's revolutionary government, Lukacs also participated in trying to reform the Hungarian Communist Party on a new basis. This party, the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party, was rapidly co opted by Janos Kader after 4 November 1956. During the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, Lukacs was present at debates of the anti party and revolutionary communist Petafi Society, while remaining part of the party apparatus. During the revolution, as mentioned in Budapest Diary, Lukacs argued for a new Soviet aligned communist party. In Lukacs's view, the new party could win social leadership only by persuasion instead of force. Lukacs envisioned an alliance between the dissident Communist Hungarian Revolutionary Youth Party, the Revolutionary Hungarian Social Democratic Party and his own Soviet-aligned party as a very junior partner. Following the defeat of the revolution, Lukacs was deported to the Socialist Republic of Romania with the rest of Nagy's government. Unlike Nagy, he narrowly avoided execution. Due to his role in Nagy's government, he was no longer trusted by the party apparatus. Lukacs's followers were indicted for political crimes throughout the 1960s and 70s, and a number fled to the West. Lukacs's books The Young Hegel, Der Junge Hegel Zurich, 1948, and The Destruction of Reason Die der Vernunft, Berlin, 1954, have been used to argue that Lukacs was covertly critical of Stalinism as an irrational distortion of Hegelian Marxism. He returned to Budapest in 1957. Lukacs publicly abandoned his positions of 1956 and engaged in self-criticism. Having abandoned his earlier positions, Lukacs remained loyal to the Communist Party until his death in 1971. In his last years, following the uprisings in France and Czechoslovakia in 1968, Lukacs became more publicly critical of the Soviet Union and Hungarian Communist Party. In an interview just before his death, Lukacs remarked, Without a genuine general theory of society and its movement, one does not get away from Stalinism. Stalin was a great tactician. But Stalin, unfortunately, was not a Marxist. The essence of Stalinism lies in placing tactics before strategy, practice above theory. The bureaucracy generated by Stalinism is a tremendous evil. Society is suffocated by it. Everything becomes unreal, nominalistic. People see no design, no strategic aim, and do not move. Quote, Thus Lukacs concludes, W.E. must learn to connect the great decisions of popular political power with personal needs, those of individuals. Topic. Work Topic. History and class consciousness Written between 1919 and 1922, History and Class Consciousness 1923 initiated Western Marxism. 
Lukacs emphasizes concepts such as alienation, reification, and class consciousness. Lukacs argues that methodology is the only thing that distinguishes Marxism. Even if all its substantive propositions were rejected, it would remain valid because of its distinctive method. Orthodox Marxism, therefore, does not imply the uncritical acceptance of the results of Marx's investigations. It is not the belief in this or that thesis, nor the exegesis of a sacred book. On the contrary, orthodoxy refers exclusively to method. It is the scientific conviction that dialectical materialism is the road to truth and that its methods can be developed, expanded and deepened only along the lines laid down by its founders. He criticizes Marxist revisionism by calling for the return to this Marxist method, which is fundamentally dialectical materialism. Lukacs conceives, revisionism as inherent to the Marxist theory, insofar as dialectical materialism is, according to him, the product of class struggle. For this reason the task of orthodox Marxism, its victory over revisionism and utopianism can never mean the defeat, once and for all, of false tendencies. It is an ever-renewed struggle against the insidious effects of bourgeois ideology on the thought of the proletariat. Marxist orthodoxy is no guardian of traditions, it is the eternally vigilant prophet proclaiming the relation between the tasks of the immediate present and the totality of the historical process. According to him, the premise of dialectical materialism is, we recall, it is not men's consciousness that determines their existence, but on the contrary, their social existence that determines their consciousness. Only when the core of existence stands revealed as a social process can existence be seen as the product, albeit the hitherto unconscious product, of human activity." Section 5. In line with Marx's thought, he criticizes the individualist bourgeois philosophy of the subject, which founds itself on the voluntary and conscious subject. Against this ideology, he asserts the primacy of social relations. Existence—and thus the world is the product of human activity, but this can be seen only if the primacy of social process on individual consciousness is accepted. Lukacs does not restrain human liberty for sociological determinism, to the contrary, this production of existence is the possibility of praxis. He conceives the problem in the relationship between theory and practice. Lukacs quotes Marx's words. It is not enough that thought should seek to realize itself, reality must also strive towards thought. How does the thought of intellectuals relate to class struggle, if theory is not simply to lag behind history, as it is in Hegel's philosophy of history? Minerva always comes at the dusk of night. Lukacs criticizes Friedrich Engels's anti during saying that he does not even mention the most vital interaction, namely the dialectical relation between subject and object in the historical process, let alone give it the prominence it deserves. This dialectical relation between subject and object is the basis of Lukacs's critique of Immanuel Kant's epistemology, according to which the subject is the exterior, universal and contemplating subject, separated from the object. For Lukacs, ideology is a projection of the class consciousness of the bourgeoisie, which functions to prevent the proletariat from attaining consciousness of its revolutionary position. Ideology determines the form of objectivity. Thus the very structure of knowledge. According to Lukacs, real science must attain the concrete totality, through which only it is possible to think the current form of objectivity as a historical period. Thus, the so-called eternal laws of economics are dismissed as the ideological illusion projected by the current form of objectivity. What is orthodoxical Marxism? Section 3. He also writes, it is only when the core of being has showed itself as social becoming, that the being itself can appear as a product, so far unconscious, of human activity, and this activity, in turn, as the decisive element of the transformation of being. Quote opening parenthesis quote. What is orthodoxical Marxism? Section 5 Finally. Orthodoxical Marxism is not defined as interpretation of capital as if it were the Bible or an embrace of Marxist thesis but as fidelity to the Marxist method, dialectics. Lukacs presents the category of reification whereby, due to the commodity nature of capitalist society, social relations become objectified. This precludes the spontaneous emergence of class consciousness. In this context, the need for a party in the Leninist sense emerges, the subjective aspect of the reinvigorated Marxian dialectic. 
In his later career, Lukacs repudiated the ideas of history and class consciousness, in particular the belief in the proletariat as a subject object of history. 1960 postface to French translation. As late as 1925–1926, he still defended these ideas, in an unfinished manuscript, which he called Talism and the Dialectic. It was not published until 1996 in Hungarian and English in 2000 under the title A Defense of History and Class Consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Literary and aesthetic work In addition to his standing as a Marxist political thinker, Lukacs was an influential literary critic of the 20th century. His important work in literary criticism began early in his career, with The Theory of the Novel, a seminal work in literary theory and the theory of genre. The book is a history of the novel as a form, and an investigation into its distinct characteristics. In The Theory of the Novel, he coins the term, transcendental homelessness, which he defines as the longing of all souls for the place in which they once belonged, and the nostalgia, for utopian perfection, a nostalgia that feels itself and its desires to be the only true reality." Lukacs later repudiated the theory of the novel, writing a lengthy introduction that described it as erroneous, but nonetheless containing a "...romantic anti-capitalism." which would later develop into Marxism. This introduction also contains his famous dismissal of Theodor Adorno and others in Western Marxism as having taken up residence in the Grand Hotel Abyss. Lukacs's later literary criticism includes the well-known essay, Kafka or Thomas Mann? in which Lukacs argues for the work of Thomas Mann as a superior attempt to deal with the condition of modernity, and criticizes Franz Kafka's brand of modernism. Lukacs steadfastly opposed the formal innovations of modernist writers like Kafka, James Joyce, and Samuel Beckett, preferring the traditional aesthetic of realism. During his time in Moscow in the 1930s, Lukacs worked on Marxist views of aesthetics while belonging to the group around an influential Moscow magazine, The Literary Critic, Literaturny Critic. The editor of this magazine, Mikhail Lifshitz, was an important Soviet author on aesthetics. Lifshitz's views were very similar to Lukacs's insofar as both argued for the value of the traditional art, despite the drastic difference in age Lifshitz was much younger both Lifshitz and Lukacs indicated that their working relationship at that time was a collaboration of equals. Lukacs contributed frequently to this magazine, which was also followed by Marxist art theoreticians around the world through various translations published by the Soviet government. The collaboration between Lifshitz and Lukacs resulted in the formation of an informal circle of the like-minded Marxist intellectuals connected to the journal Literaturny Critic the Literary Critic, published monthly starting in the summer of 1933 by the Organizational Committee of the Writers' Union. A group of thinkers formed around Lifshitz, Lukacs and Andrei Platonov, they were concerned with articulating the aesthetical views of Marx and creating a kind of Marxist aesthetics that had not yet been properly formulated. Lukacs famously argued for the revolutionary character of the novels of Sir Walter Scott and Honoré de Balzac. Lukacs felt that both authors' nostalgic, pro-aristocratic politics allowed them accurate and critical stances because of their opposition albeit reactionary, to the rising bourgeoisie. This view was expressed in his later book The Historical Novel published in Russian in 1937, then in Hungarian in 1947, as well as in his essay, Realism in the Balance. 1938. The historical novel is probably Lukacs's most influential work of literary history. In it he traces the development of the genre of historical fiction. While prior to 1789, he argues, people's consciousness of history was relatively underdeveloped, the French Revolution and Napoleonic Wars that followed brought about a realization of the constantly changing, evolving character of human existence. This new historical consciousness was reflected in the work of Sir Walter Scott, whose novels use representative or typical characters to dramatize major social conflicts and historical transformations, for example the dissolution of feudal society in the Scottish Highlands and the entrenchment of mercantile capitalism. Lukacs argues that Scott's new brand of historical realism was taken up by Balzac and Tolstoy, and enabled novelists to depict contemporary social life not as a static drama of fixed, universal types, but rather as a moment of history, constantly changing, open to the potential of revolutionary transformation. For this reason he sees these authors as progressive and their work as potentially radical, despite their own personal conservative politics. 
For Lukacs, this historical realist tradition began to give way after the 1848 revolutions, when the bourgeoisie ceased to be a progressive force and their role as agents of history was usurped by the proletariat. After this time, historical realism begins to sicken and lose its concern with social life as inescapably historical. He illustrates this point by comparing Flaubert's historical novel Salambo to that of the earlier realists. For him, Flaubert's work marks a turning away from relevant social issues and an elevation of style over substance. Why he does not discuss sentimental education, a novel much more overtly concerned with recent historical developments, is not clear. For much of his life Lukacs promoted a return to the realist tradition that he believed it had reached its height with Balzac and Scott, and bemoaned the supposed neglect of history that characterized modernism. The historical novel has been hugely influential in subsequent critical studies of historical fiction, and no serious analyst of the genre fails to engage at some level with Lukacs's arguments. Topic: Realism in the Balance, 1938, Lukacs's defense of literary realism. The initial intent of realism in the balance, s get um den realismus. Stated at its outset, is debunking the claims of those defending expressionism as a valuable literary movement. Lukacs addresses the discordance in the community of modernist critics, whom he regarded as incapable of deciding which writers were expressionist and which were not, arguing that perhaps there is no such thing as an expressionist writer. But although his aim is ostensibly to criticize what he perceived as the overvaluation of modernist schools of writing at the time the article was published, Lukacs uses the essay as an opportunity to advance his formulation of the desirable alternative to these schools. He rejects the notion that modern art must necessarily manifest itself as a litany of sequential movements, beginning with naturalism, and proceeding through impressionism and expressionism to culminate in surrealism. For Lukacs, the important issue at stake was not the conflict that results from the modernists' evolving oppositions to classical forms, but rather the ability of art to confront an objective reality that exists in the world, an ability he found almost entirely lacking in modernism. Lukacs believed that desirable alternative to such modernism must therefore take the form of realism, and he enlists the realist authors Maxime Gorky, Thomas and Heinrich Mann, and Romain Rolland to champion his cause. To frame the debate, Lukacs introduces the arguments of critic Ernst Bloch, a defender of expressionism, and the author to whom Lukacs was chiefly responding. He maintains that modernists such as Bloch are too willing to ignore the realist tradition, an ignorance that he believes derives from a modernist rejection of a crucial tenet of Marxist theory, a rejection which he quotes Bloch as propounding. This tenet is the belief that the system of capitalism is an objective totality of social relations and it is fundamental to Lukacs's arguments in favor of realism. He explains that the pervasiveness of capitalism, the unity in its economic and ideological theory, and its profound influence on social relations comprise a closed integration, or totality, an objective whole that functions independent of human consciousness. Lukacs cites Marx to bolster this historical materialist worldview. The relations of production in every society form a whole. He further relies on Marx to argue that the bourgeoisie's unabated development of the world's markets are so far reaching as to create a unified totality, and explains that because the increasing autonomy of elements of the capitalist system, such as the autonomy of currency, is perceived by society as crisis, there must be an underlying unity that binds these seemingly autonomous elements of the capitalist system together, and makes their separation appear as crisis. Returning to modernist forms, Lukacs stipulates that such theories disregard the relationship of literature to objective reality, in favor of the portrayal of subjective experience and immediacy that do little to evince the underlying capitalist totality of existence. It is clear that Lukacs regards the representation of reality as art's chief purpose. In this he is perhaps not in disagreement with the modernists. But he maintains that. If a writer strives to represent reality as it truly is, i.e. if he is an authentic realist, then the question of totality plays a decisive role. True realists demonstrate the importance of the social context, and since the unmasking of this objective totality is a crucial element in Lukacs's Marxist ideology, he privileges their authorial approach. Lukacs then sets up a dialectical opposition between two elements he believes inherent to human experience. He maintains that this dialectical relation exists between the 
appearance of events as subjective, unfettered experiences and their essence as provoked by the objective totality of capitalism. Lukacs explains that good realists, such as Thomas Mann, create a contrast between the consciousnesses of their characters appearance and a reality independent of them essence. According to Lukacs, Mann succeeds because he creates this contrast. Conversely, modernist writers fail because they portray reality only as it appears to themselves and their characters—subjectively—and fail to pierce the surface of these immediate, subjective experiences to discover the underlying essence, i.e. the real factors that relate their experiences to the hidden social forces that produce them. The pitfalls of relying on immediacy are manifold, according to Lukacs. Because the prejudices inculcated by the capitalist system are so insidious, they cannot be escaped without the abandonment of subjective experience and immediacy in the literary sphere. They can only be superseded by realist authors who abandon and transcend the limits of immediacy, by scrutinizing all subjective experiences and measuring them against social reality." This is no easy task. Lukacs relies on Hegelian dialectics to explain how the relationship between this immediacy and abstraction affects a subtle indoctrination on the part of capitalist totality. The circulation of money, he explains, as well as other elements of capitalism, is entirely abstracted away from its place in the broader capitalist system, and therefore appears as a subjective immediacy, which elides its position as a crucial element of objective totality. Although abstraction can lead to the concealment of objective reality, it is necessary for art, and Lukacs believes that realist authors can successfully employ it to penetrate the laws governing objective reality, and to uncover the deeper, hidden, mediated, not immediately perceptible of relationships that go to make up society." After a great deal of intellectual effort, Lukacs claims a successful realist can discover these objective relationships and give them artistic shape in the form of a character's subjective experience. Then, by employing the technique of abstraction, the author can portray the character's experience of objective reality as the same kind of subjective, immediate experience that characterize totality's influence on non-fictional individuals. The best realists, he claims, depict the vital, but not immediately obvious forces at work in objective reality. They do so with such profundity and truth that the products of their imagination can potentially receive confirmation from subsequent historical events. The true masterpieces of realism can be appreciated as holes, which depict a wide-ranging and exhaustive objective reality like the one that exists in the non-fictional world. After advancing his formulation of a desirable literary school, a realism that depicts objective reality, Lukacs turns once again to the proponents of modernism. Citing Nietzsche, who argues that the mark of every form of literary decadence is that life no longer dwells in the totality." Lukacs strives to debunk modernist portrayals, claiming they reflect not on objective reality, but instead proceed from subjectivity to create a homemade model of the contemporary world. The abstraction and immediacy inherent in modernism portrays essences of capitalist domination divorced from their context, in a way that takes each essence in isolation rather than taking into account the objective totality that is the foundation for all of them. Lukacs believes that the social mission of literature is to clarify the experience of the masses, and in turn show these masses that their experiences are influenced by the objective totality of capitalism, and his chief criticism of modernist schools of literature is that they fail to live up to this goal, instead proceeding inexorably towards more immediate, more subjective, more abstracted versions of fictional reality that ignore the objective reality of the capitalist system. Realism, because it creates apparently subjective experiences that demonstrate the essential social realities that provoke them, is for Lukacs the only defensible or valuable literary school of the early 20th century. Topic. Ontology of social being Later in life Lukacs undertook a major exposition on the ontology of social being, which has been partly published in English in three volumes. The work is a systematic treatment of dialectical philosophy in its materialist form. Bibliography History and Class Consciousness ISBN 0-262-62020-0 The Theory of the Novel 
ISBN 0-262-62027-8. Lenin, A Study in the Unity of His Thought 1998. ISBN 1-85984-174-0. A Defense of History and Class Consciousness 2000. ISBN 1-85984-747-1. Topic. See also Budapest School Lukax. Lajos Janasi, Lukax's adopted son Marx's notebooks on the history of technology Topic. Notes Topic. References Topic. Sources Topic. Further reading Ferner, James. Commodity Form Philosophy. In Marx on Capitalism, The Interaction Recognition Antinomy Thesis, Leiden, Brill, 2018. pp. 85-128. Gerhardt, Christina. Georg Lukacs. The International Encyclopedia of Revolution and Protest, 1500 to the Present, 8 vols. Ed. Emanuel Ness, Malden, Blackwell, 2009, 2135-2137. Hohendahl, Peter Uva. The Scholar, the Intellectual, and the Essay, Weber, Luckix, Adorno, and Postwar Germany. German Quarterly 70.3, 217-231. Hohendahl, Peter U. Art Work and Modernity, The Legacy of Georg Luckix. New German Critique, an interdisciplinary journal of German studies 42, 1987, 33 to 49. Hohendahl, Peter Uva, and Blackwell Janine. Georg Lukax in the GDR, on recent developments in literary theory. New German Critique, an interdisciplinary journal of German studies 12, 1977, 169 to 174. Jameson, Frederick. Marxism and Form, 20th Century Dialectical Theories of Literature. Princeton, Princeton University Press, 1972. Stern, L. George Lukax, An Intellectual Portrait. Descent, Vol. 5, No. 2 Spring 1958, pp. 162-173. External links Works by Georg Lukacs at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Georg Lukacs at Internet Archive Georg Lukacs Archive, Marxists website Guide to Literary Theory, Johns Hopkins University Press Georg Lukacs, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Petri Lukonen, Georg Lukacs. Books and Writers Bendel Julia, Lukacs Georg Eilid a Shazadfertilatl 1918 IG Lukax and Imre Lakatos Hungarian Biography Georg Lukax Archive, Libertarian Communist Library Molt Kor Tortenelmi Portal Past Age Historic Portal, Lukax Georg was born 120 years ago in Hungarian Levi Blanc, Georg Lukax, The Antinomies of Melancholy. Other Voices, Volume 1 No. 1, 1998. Michael J. Thompson, Lukax Revisited. New Politics, 2001, Issue 30.